heaven has abandoned China owing to its haughtiness and extravagant luxury. But I, living in the northern wilderness, have not inordinate passions. I hate luxury and exercise moderation. At military exercises, I am always in the front, and in time of battle am never behind. In the space of seven years I have succeeded in accomplishing great work and uniting the whole world in one empire. I have not myself distinguished qualities." So opens a letter from Mongol Emperor Chinggis Khan in 1219. Emphasizing his qualities and extreme humility, it's easy to imagine this as part of the many ultimatums the Mongols sent demanding submission by the will of the eternal blue heaven. However, this was not sent to any monarch, but a Taoist sage, and the letter goes on to describe the graces of Chu Chuji, begging him to come and provide his wisdom, and the secret to eternal life to Chinggis Khan. In this video, we will describe the Great Khan's quest for eternal life. Three great belief systems, Buddhism, Confucianism and Taoism, have long intertwined with and influenced Chinese life and government. In the mid-12th century emerged a Taoist sect that combined elements of Buddhist and Confucian thought, the Chuanzhen sect. Founded by Wang Zhe, a man more noted for his eccentricity than sanctity, the Chuanzhen soon was associated with prolonging life through controlling one's internal alchemy, via, among other things, total celibacy. Thus the Chuanzhen leadership, including Chu Chuji, were invited to the Jin capital of Zhongdu in 1188 to share their knowledge with the ailing emperor Shizong of Jin. The fact that Jin Shizong died the next year, and that Wang Zhe died at age 57, did little to dispel the association of longevity. Chiu Chuji was among Wang Zhe's earliest disciples, and after his master's death, became one of the sect's lead figures, earning the title of Master Changchun. After Shizong of Jin's death, Chiu Chuji was largely confined to his home region in Shandong, where he and other Chuanzhen leaders cultivated the sect's popularity until it became one of North China's most prominent. As his fame grew, Chiu Chuji received invitations from both the Jin and Song dynasties. Both were declined, but the messenger from Chinggis Khan in 1219 could not be so easily ignored. Chinggis Khan learned of Chiu Chuji through his personal physician, a defector from the Jin dynasty named Liu Zhonglu. It was he who heard of the Taoist sage and brought him to Chinggis' attention, having heard rumors Chiu Chuji was over 300 years old. He told the Khan that the Taoist would be able to share these secrets and prolong his life. The meeting was also encouraged by another advisor, the Kitan scholar Yerlu Chutsai perhaps the most famous non-Mongolian administrator of the empire. Descended from the former Kitan Liao ruling clan and a well-educated Buddhist, Chutsai was well known for his effort to curtail violence under both Chinggis Khan and his successor Ogadai. Entering Mongol service in 1218, he impressed them with his knowledge, loyalty, height, deep voice and long beard, for which they called him Urtu Sakal. Chutsai hoped the Taoist would help pacify the Khan's more violent tendencies, and it is likely Chutsai drafted the letters to Chiu Chuji, though he later regretted it. Regardless of whether the man could offer the secret to eternal life, Chiu Chuji was an influential religious leader within the territory the Mongols wished to conquer. To have him on their side was valuable in both the spiritual realm, for his prayers could entice heaven's continued support for the Mongols and in the physical world by encouraging his followers to accept and support Mongol rule. Declining was not an option for Chiu Chuji when Liu Zhonglu arrived with the Khan's message and 20 armed Mongols in late 1219. Chiu Chuji and several disciples, including one who wrote an account of the journey, set out with Liu Zhonglu in early 1220, traveling through war-torn North China. In April, they reached the Mongol-occupied ruins of Zhongdu, renamed Yan, where Chiu Chuji was received by ecstatic crowds. There the party learned that Chinggis had set out against Khwarezm. Chiu Chuji did not want to make the trek to Central Asia, but Liu Zhonglu forced him on. Chiu Chuji's next stalling tactic 
was directed at the large group of young girls Liu Zhonglu was collecting to present to the Khan, which the celibate Chiu Chuji refused to travel with. A flustered Liu Zhonglu sent a messenger to Chinggis, and they spent most of 1220 near Yen awaiting the Khan's reply, when in winter, messengers arrived from Chinggis's youngest brother, Temuga, who wished to hear his words. In February 1221, they set out after receiving the Great Khan's response, but not before Chiu Chuji told his adherents in Yen he would return in three years' time. Travelling north, they passed through the fortifications which the Mongols had broken through in 1211. Crossing the Yehuling, the site of the bloody battle of the Badger's Mouth Pass, they saw the ground still littered with human bones. When the party reached Temuga's encampment in northeastern Mongolia in the spring, Temuga inquired about the secrets to prolonging life. Chiu Chuji told him it was improper for the prince to learn before the emperor, and Temuga smartly supplied them with oxen and carts to hurry them on to his older brother. The voyage provides a fascinating view of early imperial Mongolia, visiting the Orkhon Valley and encampment cities like Chingai Balasagan, where they met the eponymous Chinkai, a senior minister of the empire who expedited their journey. Jurchen and Tangut princesses that Chinggis had taken as wives came out to meet Chiu Chuji, as did the Chinese who were transplanted west in Mongol service. In their lengthy and difficult journey westwards, they followed roads cut by Mongol armies and at times were forced to tie ropes around carts and animals to lift or lower them through mountain passes. In December 1221, they reached Samarkand, Chiu Chuji wintering in the palace of the late Khwarezm Shah Muhammad II. Here he met Yolu Chutsai and discussed religion and philosophy. The Khitan scholar promptly learned that Chiu Chuji knew almost nothing of Buddhism and soon regarded the Taoist as a charlatan. Judging from the writings of Chiu Chuji's disciple, the master found great pleasure in Samarkand, particularly in its gardens, describing them as finer than those in China. He noted that Samarkand had a quarter of its former population, and was now full of Chinese, Khitans, Turks and Tanguts who had travelled with the Mongol army. The party lounged in Samarkand until April 1222, when Chinggis's messengers summoned them, as Chinggis was making his way north after his victory over Jalal al-Din Mingbernu in November 1221 at the Indus. Chiu Chuji met Chinggis Khan in what is now Afghanistan on the 22nd of May 1222, where the Khan was joyed that this old man had made such an arduous voyage to meet him. After allowing him a meal, the Khan asked, Sainted man, you have come from a great distance. Have you a medicine of immortality? To which Chiu Chuji replied, There are means for preserving life, but no medicines for immortality. Publicly, Chinggis Khan lauded Chiu Chuji for his honesty. For an elderly man to travel such a distance, only to tell the world conqueror no, required quite some courage, and the Khan always respected that. Chinggis was not yet finished with him, and pitched him a tent beside his own. They were to travel together to the Hindu Kush to wait out the summer heat, though Chinggis spent the next months putting down local rebellions, allowing Chiu Chuji to return to Samarkand to enjoy melons and baths. By the end of August, Chinggis Khan was ready for him. Chinggis once more showed the master great respect and patience, something the Taoist did not quite reciprocate. Chiu Chuji was not required to bow or kneel before the Khan, and when the Khan offered him Irag, the fermented mare's milk so beloved by the Mongols, Chiu Chuji refused to drink it. Every day Chinggis invited Chiu Chuji to join him for dinner, and every day he declined, saying he preferred seclusion. The master told Chinggis to keep his soldiers distant, for the noise annoyed him, and when the army moved north in autumn 1222 and wintered near Samarkand, Chiu Chuji was given leave to take up in the palace once more. Chinggis Khan and Chiu Chuji had several meetings, accompanied by Chinkai, Liu Zhonglu, and the Khitan governor of Samarkand, Yulu Ahai, as translators. Together, they discussed the concepts of the Tao, in which Chinggis was supposedly very interested. 
Xiu Chuji's disciple failed to provide specific details of these discussions. Though we know he urged Chinggis to show mercy on the Chinese, establish a buffer state in North China, and lift taxes for three years. In January 1223, their journey east resumed, though the Taoist was displeased with their speed. By March, he wanted to set out on his own, hoping to return to Shandong before the end of the year. Chinggis urged him to stay, saying his sons would soon arrive and that he needed more information. Xiu Chuji coolly replied that he had told the Khan everything he knew. Later that month, Chinggis Khan was thrown from his horse while hunting wild boar. When he learned of this, Xiu Chuji called it a warning from heaven, a sign the Khan should give up hunting in his old age. Reluctantly, Chinggis gave up his favorite activity for two months. Xiu Chuji's advice on abstaining from sexual intercourse to prolong his life was likewise ignored. Continuing to badger Chinggis to allow him to leave, the Khan finally acquiesced, and in April 1223, they separated. The master declined the gifts Chinggis Khan offered, except for one, an edict declaring Taoists exempt from taxation and corvée labor. Xi Chuji returned to Yen, modern Beijing, in the first months of 1224, within three years, as he had foretold. He spent the remainder of his life in that city, dying in August 1227, the same month as Chinggis Khan. When Chinggis Khan proclaimed Taoists exempt from taxation, the stipulation was that no more Taoists could be ordained, followed a few months later with a proclamation making Chiu Chuji the head of all the Taoists and Buddhists of China. As Chiu Chuji fell ill after his return, the Khan's edicts were taken advantage of by ambitious disciples. As the edict was made known, Thousands joined Chuanzhen temples to escape taxation and forced labor for the Mongols. Likely, thousands of lives were saved through this, and Chuanzhen Taoism expanded rapidly. One scholar, Yuan Haowen, estimated that by the late 13th century, some 20% of northern Chinese were adherents. Even today, it's one of the most popular forms of Taoism in China. Less positively was that the Khan's elevation of Chiu Chuji's status over Buddhists turned into a free license to confiscate Buddhist temples, destroy Buddhist artifacts and texts, and force the conversion of Buddhist monks and nuns. When the Buddhist Yolu Chutsai returned to Yen in 1228, he was infuriated by how the Chuanzhen had taken advantage of the privileges granted to them, compounding Chutsai's existing dislike of Chiu Chuji who he saw as a fraudster, taking advantage of the Khan's generosity and power. In 1229, Yolu Chutsai wrote a lengthy work criticizing Chiu Chuji, while blaming himself for having encouraged the meeting. He accused Chiu Chuji of being complicit in the seizure and desecration of Buddhist temples, and Chutsai tells us that Chiu Chuji died on the toilet. Yolu Chutsai's work provides a fascinating counterbalance to the more hagiographic account of the journey provided by Chiu Chuji's disciple, though Chutsai's writing remained difficult to access, leaving Chiu Chuji's reputation intact as a savior of the Chinese. The influence of Chuanzhen Taoism and its armed conflict with Buddhists continued until the reign of Chinggis's grandson Kublai, when arson attacks forced the Khan to stop being considerate. Kublai, who was a Buddhist, outlawed a number of Taoist books, their privileges were drastically reduced, and they were forced to return Buddhist temples and property. This was a critical blow to the influence of Taoism among the Mongols, from which they never recovered. We'll continue making more videos on the history of the Mongols, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see them. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.